A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 10. We'll try to finish the War on Four Fronts section in this reading. We left off with Johnson dismissing Stanton a second time and replacing him with Lorenzo Thomas. Modern readers must note that in the 19th century context of separation of powers, the Congress had no constitutional right of review for executive appointment offices. In firing and hiring cabinet members, Johnson was not only fully within his constitutional rights, but he was in keeping with the actions of virtually every chief executive before him. Realistically, however, the radicals saw Johnson as an obstacle to their programs, and neither the law nor the Constitution could be allowed to stand in the way. At any rate, with the Thomas appointment, a truly extraordinary scene unfolded. Stanton refused to vacate his office and had a warrant issued for Thomas's arrest. Whereas Johnson sent Thomas's name, the second in a few months, to the Senate for approval. This time, there was no doubt among the House Judiciary Committee members who recommended 11 articles of impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors. Nine articles specifically related to Stanton's illegal in the eyes of the House dismissal. One involved Johnson's speeches, and the 11th catch-all article lumped together every charge the radicals could find. It was Thaddeus Stevens' moment of triumph, so ill that he had to have the clerk read his speech inaugurating the impeachment committee. He was nevertheless so obsessed by enmity toward Johnson that he lashed out, Unfortunate, unhappy man, behold your doom. So spiteful was Stevens' speech that the northern press stood back aghast. The New York Herald wrote that Stevens had the bitterness and hatred of Marat and the unscrupulousness of Robespierre. Although many historians condemn the impeachment process as rash, reckless, and unwarranted, it is significant that the full House vote was a substantial 126 to 47. This was a ratio far higher than the House impeachment vote against Bill Clinton a century later, 228 to 206, on the key article of perjury following a sexual harassment suit brought against him. A Senate trial of Johnson soon followed. Although modern Americans are slightly more familiar with the process of impeachment because of the Clinton case, the mechanics are nevertheless worth restating. After a full House vote in favor of articles of impeachment, the president is officially impeached, but then must stand trial before the Senate. The prosecutors of the case, however, are House managers who presented the evidence for removing the chief executive. According to the Constitution, the House, and only the House, determines whether the offenses constitute high crimes and misdemeanors. In other words, once the House has turned out articles of impeachment, the Senate's only constitutional function is determine guilt or innocence. Senators cannot, at least according to the Constitution, determine that a president is guilty, yet conclude that removal is too great a penalty. Rather, the House has already found that if the president committed the acts of which he was accused, the penalty is automatic. The structure, however, produced an unfortunate flaw in practice, namely that since the Senate would always be second and final body to judge a president, its members could ignore the requirement that they rule on guilt or innocence only, and instead re-argue the question of whether the behavior fits the high crimes and misdemeanor bar. Both American impeachment trials resulted in the Senates of the respective days ignoring their constitutional charge and insinuating themselves into the powers and prerogatives of the House. When the House managers prepared their case, John A. Bingham of Ohio headed the prosecution. Formerly opposed to impeachment, Bingham had finally concluded Johnson had to go. Radicals dominated the prosecution team and took the most extreme positions, attempting to paint Johnson as a wild-eyed dictator bent on overthrowing the government. In a remarkable display, 
Senator Benjamin Butler waved a nightshirt allegedly stained with the blood of an Ohio carpetbagger who had been flogged by Mississippi ruffians to show the lawlessness of the South. From that point in every election, Republicans would wave the bloody shirt, and the tactic proved effective until the mid-1880s. It was less useful for Bingham, however. Johnson's defense attorneys made eloquent speeches on the president's behalf. More important, no one could produce evidence of treason or truly criminal intent by Johnson, who had sought only to challenge a constitutional question. All this made the moderates uneasy about the precedent of unseating a sitting president. When the Senate voted on the catch-all Article 11, the total was 35 to convict and 19 not guilty, providing Johnson with a single vote margin needed to keep him in office. The Senate had voted to keep an unpopular president in office on the basis that his crimes were not sufficient to warrant his removal. The American system depended on officials being virtuous and observing the law. When a chief executive, such as Andrew Jackson, who ignored the Supreme Court ruling, or Johnson, who defied Congress, chooses not to obey the law, the removal process virtually always boils down to personal popularity or individual intent. Up to the present, no president has so lacked in either of these categories to warrant conviction. Other acquittals for Johnson quickly followed, and the trial ended. Some assumed that merely the impeachment and the trial would chastise and restrain Johnson, but the stubborn Tennessean dug in his heels even more. The trial did chasten the radicals, who realized they had pushed too hard, and they reluctantly concluded that the nation was not yet in agreement with their vision of absolute black equality or northern domination of the South. They concluded that winning the White House again in 1868 would require someone not obviously associated with their faction and someone the public trusted. The Republican National Convention in Chicago took only one ballot to choose Ulysses S. Grant as the party's nominee. Johnson vainly attempted to form a Lincoln-type coalition, but he could not win the nomination of his own party. Instead, the Democrats turned to Horatio Seymour, New York's wartime governor who had castigated Lincoln as a dictator and despot, and called the Irish draft rioters my friends. Republicans had no trouble painting Seymour as a copperhead, nor was he helped by a new wave of Klan racial violence in the South. Seymour's running mate, Frank P. Blair Jr. of Missouri, made matters worse by referring to the corrupt military despotism that still governed the South. Statements such as Blair's terrified Northerners. Edward Pierpont, a Democrat from New York City, wrote, I cannot conceive how any intelligent man who does not wish the rebels returned to power and the lost cause restored can vote against Grant. Grant hewed to the traditional Republican agenda, high tariffs, internal improvements, and above all, stability and moderation toward Reconstruction affairs. A gold standard supporter, Grant nevertheless supported the Pendleton plan for paying off federal bonds with greenbacks, unless specifically stated that they be paid in gold. Paying for the war debt in greenbacks represented a commitment to slight inflation. For most voters, though, Grant, not the platform, was the deciding factor. His campaign slogan, Let Us Have Peace, appealed to the people of both sections. In the election, despite the absence of three still unconstructed states, 78% of eligible voters cast ballots. Grant received 53% of the popular vote, despite the fact that Seymour got almost 200,000 votes from Kentucky and Louisiana alone. Grant smashed Seymour in the Electoral College, 214 to 80. Some 500,000 blacks voting for the first time thus decided the election. Seymour took the highest electoral state, his home state of New York, but Grant took most of the North and swept the Midwest and all the West, except Oregon. 
and we'll go on with Grant in the era of good stealings in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I love you guys, as Tigger says. Ta-ta for now.